when you're doing this kind of calculation, this is an x to the alpha times 1 minus x to the beta, okay? So you know very well this is the beta function if you want, but you put just the name to say that it's just the product of, uh, of gamma function. So you can write it, at least the first few terms, okay? Here a lot of terms are missing, and you, start, and you see that the most divergent terms is 2 over epsilon squared. And you start, <coughs> you, you cannot unnotice, not notice the fact that here we had minus 2 epsilon squared, and here you have a plus 2 over epsilon squared. Okay. You know very, very well that the poles in here comes from loop momentum, when you integrate over loop momentum, okay. The poles in here instead, they come out uh, when, you when you try to do the integration over the phase space, okay. They were not there, okay. The double differential cross-section for the producing a Q, Q, Y, and a G, and a Q, O, is not divergent. When you try to integrate on that, it gets divergent, okay. And it comes from the region of the soft and collinear region because it comes from where x goes to 1, x1 goes to 1, x2 goes to 1, or both go to 1, okay? And I told you before, this is a collinear and soft region. They have nothing to do with, they have no, uh, they have nothing to do with <coughs> renormalization, okay? At this point, there is nothing to renormalize, okay? So these are, they are not connected with ultraviolet divergences. Okay, is it clear? So there is nothing, this is nothing to do with renormalization, okay? This is something completely different. So, I've done the calculation for you, but <laughs> an exercise is waiting for you to check this expression, because since I'm nasty, uh, I might have put some, uh, some errors around, uh, and I would like to, to see who, who's gonna be the first one who's gonna spot them. So, again, sigma QQ bar, I've shown that before. Sigma QQ bar in blue, on, uh, after I've integrated everything, it has this expression, I sum the two, and I have something that is finite, and this is the famous one plus alpha over pi, okay? So this is the total cross-section, perfectly finite. Fine, everybody's happy, okay? Except if someone, uh, you know, some nasty guy can come to you and say, okay, what about the single differential cross-section? I don't want the total. You show me the double differential cross-section, I want just the single, okay? Single meaning I'm just detecting the fraction of the energy of one over quark, I don't care whatever it is, and you give me the cross-section at, at every range of the energy of the quark, you give me the total uh, the, the, the cross-section. Okay, let's go back one second to the previous slide. What does it mean, the single? It means that you have to do one integration less, okay? So, let, let not do the integration over x2, uh, let, uh, over x1, okay? Let's do only the integration over x2. The integration over x2, it has been transformed into an integration over t. So if you do the integral over t, you see that you get a pole from the gamma of minus epsilon. So you have, you have one over epsilon, but multiply this expression that now is not integrated. One over epsilon mean, that means that you have a divergent expression a divergent answer. So the sigma over the x, the single differential cross-section is not defined, okay? Is not defined. Is it clear? Because it's not finite. And the reason, okay, uh, is just because in the massless case, we have no mass up to now, this quantity is not infrared safe. And this is another way to say that all the poles come, coming from uh, soft and collinear region stay there, they don't cancel, okay? And you know very well, very well that in QCD only the quantities that are infrared safe uh, have some meaning because all the poles cancel, okay? And this is just the meaning of the word infrared safe. Again, wonderful exercise for you. Compute the total cross-section, let's say 15 points, okay? Do that. Now, and here we get into the, uh, into the game. Let's put a, a mass to the quark now. How we start again from the beginning? Exactly the same, the same guys, uh, the same guys with a mass, okay? A massive. Again, x is just the fraction of the energy of the quark over the energy of the beam or uh, the quark energy, the maximum energy of the, of the quark, so it goes from zero to one. I do a calculation, 
and oh wow, it has no divergence. You don't see any piece one over epsilon. Okay, but now let's let's take a look at all the pieces. You have a delta. Well, it's clear. It's this one. It's the board. Then you have alpha. So it's the sum of all of them. And you have it's a function of x, obviously. Now, some of you can say can, the first thing is what is this plus? <coughs> okay. This is this plus is just a, it's a distribution. Okay, don't get. Uh, worried about that, it just means that in case, in case you have to do the integral of this function, of any of these functions with a plus, times n, an arbitrary function, it means that that integral has this meaning. Okay? You have to take the function, subtract the function at 1, and divide by 1 minus x. Okay? This is the meaning every time in case. Okay? In case. So, what is the integral of 1 over 1 minus x plus? Answer, what is the integral of 1 over 1 minus x plus? The integral is equal to? 0. zero because it multiplies a 1, so the rule is to take 1, minus the function computed in 1, so it's 0. So the integral is 0. So if you integrate this object to get the total cross-section, so just do the integral in, into dx, these terms die, um, this term, okay, take this object, subtract the same option in x minus uh, in, in x equal to one, and do the integral. So the answer you easily discover is completely finite, and the plus distribution is just there, just to give you a finite answer. Because if it's, it could appear that it's not finite because you have a one minus x in the denominator, but it's not like that. Because since you subtract the function in x equal to one, if you do a Taylor expansion of this object. You have 1 minus a, and in the numerator you have, if you try to do an expansion of, a, of, a, of fx, okay, you have an object that uh, goes to 0 when x goes to 1. Okay, so this object is perfectly finite. So the integral of this object is perfectly, is perfectly finite. And here it is, the total perception. So the object is totally finite, but, but, Okay, one thing I forgot to tell you is just that I, I've thrown away all the terms that go to zero when the mass goes to zero. So the expression is a lot more complicated, okay, a lot more complicated. But all the terms that can go to zero when m goes to zero, I've thrown them away. Fine. This term, this is a very, very important term. <coughs> because this term, if you try to send the mass to zero, what's going to happen? It's going to explode. Okay. And and it must be obvious because the calculation with the mass equal to zero was divergent. Okay, so there must be here a, 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 a link to the previous calculation, and here it is the link. When the mass goes to zero, this object is going to explode. Okay, so you cannot send the mass to zero. By the way, again, since we are already here, notice the object that multiplies this logarithm is one plus x squared over one minus x. Remember that because it will appear at least 100 times from now to the end. Okay, this is an exercise that you plan. It's very long. Okay, it's very long. But if you throw away the right contribution, can be quite short. Let's say 25 points. But don't waste time with this one. The other one are a lot more important. Okay. So I said the the answer is perfectly finite, but is this a well-behaved perturbative expansion? The answer is obviously, let's see, let, let's wait for the answer. You can see that when the mass gets smaller and smaller, the logarithms get bigger and bigger. So we are trying to do an, exp an a perturbative expansion and the coefficient gets bigger and bigger. And there is another point that unfortunately, I'm absolutely sure I won't be able to, to talk about, but it's on the slide. What about all the non-perturbative <laughs> effect? I don't see quarks. I see bound states of quarks. I see metal, benzos, carbon. So there are two very important questions. Let's start <coughs> talking about the first one. So time for a test, kids. So imagine that you have this, this quantity. Okay, I use alpha strong equal one tenth. I'll, so the question is, I'm, 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 I have a series that starts with one. The second term is minus one hundred. So we go to minus 99. The third term is plus 5,000. So it goes to 4,000. Is this a well-behaved perturbative expansion? 
I'm, I'm going to help you because I know it's a difficult question for you. So, no, yes, what the hell is he talking about? Okay, so who thinks that this is a well, uh, not a well, this is not a good perturbative expansion? Raise your hands, please. Come on. Oh, it's not, guys. Who thinks that, yes, it is a good perturbative expansion? Come on, raise some hand. I hope that nobody's thinking, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so I would say the percentage is like that. Yes, please. No, what the hell are you talking about? It's just <laughs> <laughs> What? These are like just numerics, and I don't know what the coefficients in that after that are. So it could be very well defined. Pardon? I, I, I don't know what the next term is, so it could be very well defined if all the coefficients of the next term. Yeah, but possible. you know, I'm just, I'm just asking you, <laughs> having seen these terms, what do you think? No, I, I, I you have no idea. <laughs> so, but it's not what the hell is he talking about. It's, I'm sorry, I have no idea, right? Okay. That was not on there. You're right, so one point. This guy has already got one point, come on. Oops. Well, I'm telling you that I got this. G for me is the exponent of minus 1000 alpha strong. If you start expanding that, I've got 1 minus 1000 alpha strong plus 1,000 for strong square over 2 factorial in this object here. So this object is perfectly finite. Actually, it's a little, it's quite small. Not only finite, but it's quite close to zero. Okay, so it seems that you had something that is not, absolutely not well behaved. Instead, it was well behaved. So what's going on? Okay, uh, what's going on is just uh, that this series here, every single term, uh, they say no mean, doesn't give you any clue about, about the series. You have to resum, <coughs> and again, this is a word that you have used, uh, you, you have heard many times, you have to resum the entire series in order to get a meaningful result. Okay. So let's see what you can do about our previous result. And to understand, I said something and I would have liked someone to stop me and say, why you said that? I said just that. Uh, Maybe I haven't said that, but it's written here that the mass m acts as a cutoff for the collinear singularity. So you've seen that with the mass, the singularity, the collinear singularity have gone away. But are we sure that it's really the collinear singularity, the, the problem, or the problem might come from something else? So let's start well, with, uh, let's start doing some anatomy of the collinear singularity. I try to be as general as possible. Okay, so imagine to have an arbitrary process, whatever you like. Okay, M can be whatever you like, but it has a final state core. Okay, massive, massive. You write the amplitude, uh, the spin off, and all the rest, and, and this is my amplitude. Okay, suppose that you emit uh, a gluon instead. Okay, so you write the amplitude is U bar, spin off here. Uh, then you have the, uh, the polarization vector. This epsilon has nothing to do with the epsilon of the polarization. Okay, this is the polarization vector of this gluon. Then you have this propagator, <coughs> one over p plus k slash minus n, times all the uh, all the <coughs> amplitude that emit a p plus k, not a p like here, but emit a p plus k. Okay, so uh, let's write a propagator in a more uh, useful way p plus k squared square minus m squared. And let's, and let's go and see how it looks like. Well, after uh, you immediately see that is the propagator is just 2p dot k, because p squared is equal to m squared, so they cancel. k squared is on shell, is, uh, uh, k squared is equal to 0. So you have just 2p, 2p dot k. I can write 2p dot k as the momentum of the, um, of the, of the gluon times uh, the component of the of the of the energy component of the gluon, the vector component of the gluon, and the cosines of the angle between the two. Okay, so you see immediately that what I was talking about. If m is equal to zero, the the denominator can go to zero, because if m is equal to zero, and the angle goes to zero, the cosines of zero is one. One minus one, you have a you are sitting on something that is not defined because it's really one over zero, okay? But even if the mass is different from zero, 
you have an object that can get bigger and bigger because you know this object think about it smaller and smaller mass even if it's true that this object is never zero but it can get bigger and bigger remember that this is in the denominator okay this object gets smaller and smaller and in the denominator it gets bigger and bigger so the cross section gets bigger and bigger is it clear so this is the region so you have a cross section okay it can be whatever whatever it is but when the gluon gets too close to the quark, this object gets bigger and bigger. So we are interested in understanding this behavior, okay, right now. And now there are a few, a few, a few, uh, let's say, uh, I have to introduce some notation, okay? It's called the pseudo of the composition. It's very, very easy. Don't, be, don't get uh, put down by the name. So. The amplitude square at the level of a ball is just the amplitude uh, before you take the square and you have p slash plus n. Okay, you can absolutely trigger. it. You take the amplitude square uh, of, the, of the amplitude I gave you before, you have one over two p dot q square is the square of the propagator, okay, times uh, the two, the absolutely arbitrary process, and in between you have a trace of, uh, of gamma matrices, okay. Now, we are interested in the collinear limit, okay? Whatever it is, I'm going to be more precise now. What, what does it? What, what, what do I mean with a collinear limit? Well, the idea is just that. Let's have a vector t, okay, as a reference vector, okay? You, we have a reference vector, okay? P and k. Let's say that I call them collinear when they are collinear with p with t, okay? So I click this vector and I, I, I move the, the, my, my, my system in such a way that the, the, the collinear direction is, is, the, colli is uh, the direction of t, okay? So I can project, remember that every four vector has four components, okay? So if you want to write these four components in terms of something else, you need uh, at least four vectors, okay? So I write the four components of p on the basis, let's say that, of t, with some coefficient z on the basis of another vector that I call it eta vector, okay? It points in the opposite direction with respect to t. t goes here, eta goes there, okay? I draw this plot just because I want you to have clear in mind what's happening, okay? And then I have two components that are the component perpendicular to this direction. <coughs> so one, co two component, one, one, four component, so I can project this vector or, uh, over these uh, four other vectors, okay? The same for k. Z is just the fraction of the momentum that, of, of the momentum that of p with, with respect to the, to the direction that I call the collinear direction. <coughs> is it clear? Okay. When do you reach the collinear direction? Well, the collinear direction, you reach the, these two vectors became, become collinear when k perp gets smaller and smaller. The smaller these components are, the more parallel K and P gets, okay? Is it clear to everybody? Okay. Having said that, I remind you that I will sum only over physical degree of freedom of the gluon. I won't propagate on physical degree of freedom of the gluon. So the sum of the polarization, I will write the sum of the polarization this way. If it's not clear this one, please, can come to me and we discuss about that uh, separately, okay? Now, p squared, t squared are equal to m squared, k squared is equal to zero because uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the momentum of the quark, the momentum of the gluon. Uh, in addition, I can uh, uh, introduce another, another, um, um, another component, let's say p plus k is gonna be t plus c eta. And from this relation, I can derive C prime and C and uh, C uh, double prime, let's say that. Okay, and I can derive my, my expression of P of K. Uh, I would like to suggest you to follow this expression. This is exact, so you have uh, you, you can check exactly from the previous uh, from the previous slide. To follow this expression in the limit when the mass goes to zero. If the mass is not z is zero, okay, you can see that P dot K, the denominator, goes to zero as the perpendicular component goes to zero, as I said before. Remember, when, the, when k per goes to zero, okay, we are reaching the collinear limit, okay? So 
n equal to zero the denominator goes to zero as k per xi primes and xi double prime are just again the component with respect to the other vector k okay? look look how how they go to zero they go to zero again think of n equal to zero they go to zero as k squared okay so when k goes to zero this component two go to zero go to zero okay just keep that in mind because I will define the quasi quasi collinear because there is a mass if there is no mass you you, you would define the collinear region but the quasi collinear region is when k goes to zero at the same time the mass gets smaller and smaller but they go to zero let's say in the same way so the ratio is finite okay so none of them go to zero quicker than than the other okay do that because this is just an exercise to do do some trivial Dirac ecology meaning Dirac work out through this uh, uh, gamma matrices okay do that and this is what you get okay now Again, we are interested only in the region where everything is exploding under you. So, first of all, I've collected in front p dot k, the quantity that is in the denominator, okay? And I see that I'm getting something like uh, uh, proportional to t slash plus m, okay? t is, again, the collinear <coughs> direction, times something, okay? Plus less singular terms, because m is going to zero with respect to this, to this quantity. Okay. T is not going to zero, so this object survived, but N goes to zero. C prime and C, they go to zero when K perp and M goes to zero, so this object are less singular than this one. K perp goes to zero. K perp is just the object that goes to zero in the collinear limb. So I'm keeping only the most singular term, <coughs> and if I do that, okay, this is the, pre the expression that I derive. Again, think about putting m equal to zero. You have one plus z squared over one minus z. I told you before about one plus x, one plus x squared over one minus x. This expression appears many, many times. So you plug it in into the factorizer, um, into the, uh, the expression we had before, and you can see immediately that before in the denominator you had p dot k squared, okay? But the expression is proportional to p dot k, so at the end, the divergence is less serious than what you expect. In fact, the divergence is only proportional to p dot k. Then you have the remaining piece times this object. But now you recognize that this object, so again, we were dealing with this one in the collinear limit. We got that this object is the propagator, this quantity, times, this is exactly as if uh, the Born had emitted just a, 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 a quark with momentum t. But t, from the, fo the formula before, is just p over z, okay? So we manage, we manage to write the amplitude in a completely factorized way, okay? We factorize an amplitude for the emission of a gluon in the collinear limit as the amplitude at the Born level times, and now let's give a name of this object, the Altarelli Parisi splitting equation, 1 plus z squared over 1 minus z, okay? Here it's more complicated because here you have the mass. In general, for a massless calculation, this object is not here, but <coughs> this is Altarelli Parisi splitting equation times p dot q. Okay, so we have written, we managed to write this object in a factorized way. Here there are some notice, some important point. First of all, why we had this cancellation? Why we started with a p dot k square and we end up, and end up with a p dot k? There is a reason, and the reason is the illicit conserv conserving of the vertex. Okay, think about that. Think about that. If it's not clear, and I'm absolutely sure that it's not clear, let's discuss together, okay? Another very, very delicate point is just that I'm using a physical gauge, okay? In the physical gauge, only the square of a single diagram that I've shown here is the most divergent. Because together with this one, you have, think about 
a process with many finite diagrams. Okay. When we do a square, you have to square each of them, and you have to do the interference with e between each of them. Okay. So, what, who told you that this is just the this is just the the most singular diagrams? What about all the interference between the diagrams? Okay. Just convince yourself and work out the, and think about that. That just this is the most singular diagram if I'm using the physical gauge. Okay. So exercise explain this ten points. Okay. So. The phase space is factorized. No, sorry, not the phase space. The amplitude <coughs> is factorized. Okay? But to compute a cross section, I need a phase space. What about the phase space? What can I do about the phase space? So, let's concentrate only with the two particles I know, P and K. All the rest, I don't know, because I, I said it's a completely arbitrary process. Okay? So, the delta of the momentum conservation and the two elements of the phase space, I do care. Okay? This is just the projection we did before. Okay? Now I want to change variable of integration. Okay? Instead of using k's, uh, kx, ky, and kz, d3k, as variable, okay? since I'm projecting on this new variable, I want to use z and c double prime as variable. Okay? So I want, to change, I want to do a change of variable between k0 uh, I, will, uh, I will do a change of value. Instead of using K0 and Kz, I will want to use Z and C double prime. Double prime. So this is a, a very, very easy change of variable. This is the Jacobian of the transformation. Trivial. Okay. So D3K over DK0 can be written as a D4K times delta K square. I think this is clear to everybody. And use that several times in the exercise I'm going to give you. Okay. This is why I, I'm interested in K0, because uh, uh, I'm going to go back to D4K. And then, OK, just write uh, D4 in terms of DK0, DKZ, DKX, and DKY, and DKZ, and change the variable. This is what I've done. The delta function with, of K squared is this object. So just put in the K squared, and you have this object. Now I'm going to use the delta to do, to do the integration over C double prime. So I have in the denominator 2, 1 minus z, eta times t. But in the denominator, in the, in the numerator, I have a Jacobian that is exactly eta times t. So they cancel. No trace of eta any longer. It was some kind of fake vector we have introduced at the, at the beginning. So the, the phase space, um, the, the integration of the k can be written in this way. Okay. Now, let's do another change of, of variables. Now, I keep k fixed, and I change the variable. Instead of p, I use t. And again, p, k, t, x, c, that are defined before. D3p is just d3t, because it's just a linear. Okay. So let's start again. n plus 1, n minus 1. Now, it's not only really an equal sign. It's an approximation, because I'm entering the regime uh, when I'm doing some, uh, when I'm throwing away everything that is not, uh, uh, let's say, divergent, okay? So, instead of this object, I will write the expression that I've computed. P0 is just, it's, it's written here, so, uh, P0. Ah, no, <coughs> this was a type, sorry. This is, um, uh, one of them is P, one is P, is a, is a, uh, this is P and this is K. So, P, or oh, 10 points for me, I spot an error. So um, I have 10 points more. Now let's see who's going to be the second one. So P is equal to Z to 0, so change of variable. This is exactly the phase space with n particle that produce an object with uh, momentum T, and this is the factorized part. Okay? Now, I factorized the amplitude square. I factorized the phase space. This means that putting things together, it means that I managed to factorize the cross-section. So the cross-section for n plus 1 body is the cross-section of n body times this object here. OK? Is it clear to everybody? Let's go back to the expression we had before. This is the expression I've computed. Remember, the integration of k per goes from 0 
to some scale. Okay, I don't know what is this scale. It's going to be dictated by the, by the, 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 the process I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. But it's not, it's not the scale of the thing that, uh, that I'm worried about. I'm worried about zero. Because if I don't have a mass, uh, the integral is over the k per square over k per square. And when k per goes to zero, this object is going to explode. Okay? So you have seen that the, the, the mass is just there and makes the integral, this part of the integral, totally finite. Okay? If in the massless limit, this, is, this explodes. Okay? And k per is the collinear limit, remember. Okay? So we, we managed to get an expression that is totally finite, but the price to pay is just that the mass has appeared inside the logarithm. Because if you do this integral, you get a logarithm. So this is a very heavy price to pay. Because when the mass, when the mass gets smaller and smaller, the logarithm gets bigger and bigger. Okay? Again, notice the structure. Sigma n plus 1, sigma n times Altarelli Parisi times logarithm <coughs> two scales. Okay? So this is the structure. Let me skip this one. Now, now sigma n plus one equals sigma n times something. Okay. So start iterate, iterate, iterate. Okay. So you believe me when I tell you that the n term of the series is proportional to logarithm of q over n, q squared over n squared to the n. Each time you iterate, you get a logarithm of q squared over n squared. You repeat n times, and this is what you get. And if alpha strong, each term is alpha strong to the n times this object to the n. So the nth term of the series is just alpha strong times this big logarithm. Is if the mass happens to be small enough, and small enough meaning that alpha times this big log is a form <coughs> you cannot truncate the series. Because each time of the series is exactly the same order of magnitude as the previous one. So you cannot stop the series. You have to resum all of them. But now you have understood that we have, we, we know each term, the structure of each term of the series. Each term, we know exactly what is the structure of them, because I've shown you before what is the structure, okay? So you know the nth term of the series. Okay, now it's up to you to find out a closed form for your series, okay? But you know every, every term. And now you believe me when I say that throwing away all power terms n squared over q squared because they are irrelevant for what we are doing now. Because this is, uh, we are mostly interested in a region where m over q gets, uh, when n gets small, okay, and because this, where, this is the region where the logarithm, the logarithm explodes, you believe me when I tell you that the total cross-section can be written as a, a part that doesn't know absolutely anything about the mass of the quark Remember that we have around logarithm of m squared over q squared, okay? The logarithm of m squared over q squared can be broken into part. Logarithm of q squared over another scale, whatever you like. Mu f squared times plus the logarithm of mu f squared over m squared, okay? You can break any logarithm, okay? So you can write the, 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 the total cross-section as in, in terms of an object that doesn't know anything about the mass, Actually, when the mass goes to zero, it's totally finite. And you compute that just sending the mass to zero, okay? And an object that knows only about the mass. Because you have seen that the mass is it's dangerous when you have the splitting, okay? But in the rest of the diagram, it's totally harmless, okay? It's there, okay? If you want mass effect, it's there. But from the point of view of the divergences, it's only the splitting that is the dangerous region, okay? So you can write that into these two factorized pieces, and this is a factorization theorem for, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the framework of heavy work production, okay? Here there are some details, but here's just an example, okay? So the total cross-section, 
uh, the sum is over all the flavor. Imagine that the flavor is a gluon. What does it mean? It means that first you have to compute, compute a piece that is just the production of the gluon with no mass. Okay? Mass is what you do a massless calculation. Okay? Because this is not, again, this is, the, the mass here is totally harmless. Okay? Convoluted, and this is the symbol of the convolution. It means that this integral is written in short with this symbol. Convoluted with uh, the gluon that splits into two massive objects, okay? Entities, the object I could give you a lot of problems because uh, you have the gluon propagator that can explode, okay? So, this is uh, uh, the factorization theorem. Uh, now, there is a question that you ask many, many times yesterday and probably today. Okay, how can I choose uh, the scale F, mu F, because now I'm in trouble. You have, I have another scale, what can I do? Okay, <laughs> let's concentrate on this part. If I choose mu squared of the order of Q squared, Q is, uh, again, sorry, central mass energy of E plus E minus. If I, I choose mu squared equal to Q squared, the big logarithm here is dead, because it's just the logarithm of one. Is it clear? So let's choose mu squared equal to Q squared. This object is perfectly finite and is well behaved because there are no big logarithms. And you can say, well, okay, <laughs> it's not that smart because the logarithm is, is in there then, okay? Because if mu squared is a whole of Q squared, here you have a big logarithm of M squared over Q squared. And it's true, but, but, there is a but. Do you remember the structure of this uh, splitting, okay? You, we have the splitting was something that was Altarelli Parisi times the logarithm, okay? Altarelli Parisi, one plus x squared over one minus x times the logarithm. So let's take the derivative of this splitting with respect to the, to the logarithm. It's, you, it's not difficult to believe for you that it's just proportional to Altarelli Parisi times a little bit of the of, of, of of splitting, okay? So, this is the evolution equation that uh, the D satisfies, okay? And this is absolutely easy to understand from what I said before. Now, my claim is just that this equation we sum correctly all the large logarithms, okay? This is my claim, meaning that if you find a solution of this equation, all the logarithms are resumed, okay? <coughs> this is an important claim. How can I show you that? I think that the easiest way to show that is by recursion. So it is this dense, but it's absolutely easy to go through. How can I find a solution of this equation? It's pretty trivial, okay, once you, you got the message. This is the equation to solve, okay? How can you solve that? Okay, let's do that by iteration, okay? So, integrate the left-hand side and the right-hand side over mu square. You have d mu square minus d mu zero is equal to integral of this uh, of the right-hand side. I've changed the name of the variable just because I want to be perfectly clear, okay? Now, second step, what do I do? Okay, d mu zero is here, nothing to do. Instead of d mu one, I plug it in the expression of d mu one. So it's the same expression where it's instead of mu squared, I put in mu one. So I have mu <coughs> zero times the integral between mu zero and mu one, okay, mu is mu one, of this object times um, p times <coughs> this object. And here it is, okay? And now you can immediately see d mu zero is independent of mu. P is a fairly Parisi, doesn't know anything about this case. I can do this integral, here it is. Plus double integral. What can I do now? Again, instead of D, I put in the previous expression, this one. Here it is. D mu zero, I can do the integral. Now I have two integrals. If you do that, it's just one half log square over mu square. And again, and again, and again, and again. So if you find a solution, if you find a solution, the solution will contain all the tower of logarithm, and there will be exact to, uh, and so since you have a closed form, they will be correctly resigned. Okay? 
So I didn't tell you how to find the solution. I just showed you that you can find that by iteration you can find the solution. But if you want the, the closed form, you have you have to be smart. You have to be smart to solve that equation. Okay? I didn't solve the equation because at this step, the left hand side and the right hand side still contain the variable. Okay? So I didn't tell you how to solve how to. I will skip this one. I will skip this one, sorry. No, let's go back. Let's talk two seconds about that. This is a, 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 the equation that this satisfies is an integral differential equation. In red, I put the word differential equation. Why? Well, when you're talking about differential equation, a solution of differential equation, what do you need? What do you need? Initial condition. You need the initial condition. Okay. So, how did I tell you how to get the initial condition? <laughs> Not yet. How do you get the initial condition for D? It's easy. Okay. Because you use the factorization theorem. Okay. This is the factorization theorem. The left hand side can be computed. We have computed that at the third slide. We computed the differential cross section, perfectly finite. So you can compute that. The part where that is massless can be computed because at the beginning of the lectures <coughs> I've computed the massless part. D is the only thing that you don't know. Okay? So you plug in an, an arbitrary expansion when where you don't know the value of this object. You plug them in and you equate the coefficient of alpha s to the zero, alpha s to the power one, and you go, go on, uh, you can go on if you're interested in more and more of it. So you can compute d1 zero and d1, and d1 one, okay? Now, what is the final recipe at the end of the day to sum correctly all this logarithm? Well, they will see, okay? This is the, the final recipe. You start with the expression, the expression of, uh, of d, and you compute this expression at the scale that is not very far from n. In this way, this expression doesn't contain large logarithm because the logarithm of the ratio of the two, of the two, uh, the two scales is close to zero. Okay. So you start from this expression. Okay. Then you take uh, the Dockchester grip of the part of Altarelli Parisi, uh, known as Altarelli Parisi for us, uh, evolution equation that I shown before. And I've shown you before that with the Altarelli Parisi equation, you can go from a small scale, mu zero, of order of m squared, to a higher scale, mu squared, of the order of q squared. And I told you that this equation will sum correctly all the logarithms. Finally, you get your expression, you plug it in in the factorization theorem, and you read on the left hand side the differential cross section where all the logarithms have been resumed. Okay. okay, this is the way to do physics when you have a massive core. I'm not going to talk about soft logarithm as uh, I knew from the beginning. I'm not going to talk about non perturbative effect, I knew that before. I'm going to tell you the end of the story. Is the end of the story is just that this is where the situation <coughs> before, I showed you at the third slide, where the theoretical prediction were a factor of three below the data. If you use the appropriate non-perturbative function, and you can find this slide before, if you use a resum formalist, you see what happens. So the disagreement is absolutely not as bad as it was before. So the situation with B core is now totally solved. Conclusion. Conclusion. So I show you what happens if you have an additional scale. Okay, in this case, it was the mass of the core. But it could be any additional scale. As soon as you put an additional scale, you might have problem with B terms in the perturbative expansion. So you won't trust the perturbative expansion unless you find a way to resum it. Okay, so I've shown you how to resum. And the resummation I've shown you the step, the step are just find, you have to find out to resum. First of all, you have to know what to resum. So you have to know the structure of the nth term of the series. And in the case of collinear singularity, 
I've shown you that by factorizing, so order by order, you know the structure of the nth term of the series, okay? So knowing the, the, the term, you can think of only some, all of them, okay? And I've shown you as the, that the long-standing puzzle, really it has been a puzzle for many, many years, has been solved, okay? I left you several problems to work out, okay? Go through them by yourself, or divide into groups, solve them, talk with each other, okay? Try to, to, to do the problems, come to me, and let's discuss about that. Again, this is something that has already been said uh, uh, yesterday. Don't be shy. I bark, but I don't bite. And people knows me, knows that better. Sometimes I bite, but not you. Okay, I'll be around till the end of the school, so we, uh, we have plenty of time. Uh, as I said, conclusion is not the last uh, slide, but we will come back at the recap because ready for you uh, some nice uh, exercise to do. Okay, I will explain all all of them to you later. So I know that you want to know them just now because you want to start doing the exercise right now. But please, you know, hold on, and uh, you will have all of them later. Thank you very much.